building, the ability to adapt trainings to match the trainee cohort and so on. There's a framework to follow. The skills landscape is a first step in developing a national skills framework to enable a coordinated and cohesive approach to skills development across the Australian e-research sector. It is also a first step, um, step towards helping to analyse current approaches to data training um, to identify siloed skills initiatives and finding ways to build partnerships and improve collaboration, um, identifying skills deficits and working to address the gaps in data skills, and also identify areas of skills development to invest in by skills uh, stakeholders like universities, research organisations, skills and training um, service providers, AIDC and, and many others. I should note here, um, which it's you know, already been spoken about in the previous um, session, and, but I'll reiterate it, AIDC is not a training organisation and it's not really, well, it's not what we're funded to do. But we do have an interest in skills uplift across the e-research sector because of the cultural change a skilled work workforce can bring. Hence, AIDC's interest in leading the development of the data skills landscape. So we're hoping the skills landscape will help us home in on the areas we should and need to focus on and help other skills providers do the same. So now I'm finally getting to the bit you're here for. Um, I do see the skills landscape as a taxonomy. So, you know, a classification of skills into an ordered set of categories. So our own data skills taxonomy, although semantic specialists might disagree, but we'll let them. So what does the skills landscape help us do? After significant consultation on e-research skills development, it was time for ARDC to connect many of the dots from multiple skills community conversations. The e-research and data skills landscape diagram aims to represent many of those conversations. We're simply laying a foundation on which to drive discussions on the national e-research skills agenda. The concrete hasn't set yet, so there's still opportunity to shape it further. And I'll give a shout out here to Natasha Simons, who kickstarted these conversations with skills communities and was um, the person along with the skilled workforce team at that time who put the skills landscape diagram together. And I think it was a, you know, well, I would think it's a non-trivial task. So the, the landscape diagram aims to assist in identifying the skills needed for data intensive research. And I think the skills landscape largely answers this question, although we may have missed some skills. So let us know. And actually some skills may have dropped off of the, the landscape that you might think actually belong back in there. So let us know about that as well. So we could also use it to highlight cross-cutting skills and we've outlined, um, well, we've used this, the landscape to outline and describe a generalized set of data related roles. And it also indicates who needs these skills and at what level of competence. And the work that stems from the skills landscape, such as creating role profiles and skills learning paths, could help to answer this question a little further as well. And I'll, I'll provide an example of each in subsequent slides. And finally, I think identify um, it, this, the skills landscape um, can identify training providers and the skills that they cover. You know, is there uh, overlap and dupl duplication? Are there gaps? I have an activity later in the session that I really am praying and hoping won't fall over, but anyway, we'll see how we go, that hopefully helps to capture some of this information from you. We assume there is significant overlap and duplication, but interestingly, I've been involved in a lightweight working group that is looking at just this question and the data from each of the organisations involved in this working group indicates very little duplication so far. This could change once we have a more comprehen uh, comprehensive sample of course metadata and overlaps and duplications could start to become more apparent. So this work will be highlighted in community action session number three at 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesday. So get, if you're interested in this area, get along to that, that session. So 
This is the beginning slide of the skills landscape. This slide um, hopefully provides some scope or context. And I'll just point out a couple of things from here. I've already talked about why develop a skills landscape, so we won't go there again. Um, who is the skills landscape for? Generally, anyone who wants to understand the skills needed to work with research data, build capability and improve current skills development offerings across their organisations and the e-research sector. The skills landscape slides themselves are a generalised identification of skills, not roles. So try not to get the two um, mixed up when you're, you're looking at them and thinking about the skills. And the skills landscape, we've tried to put it, you know, look at it through the lens of course unit. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether you think we've, we've actually managed that. Um, so comments about that would be really useful too. This is the higher level structure of the landscape and shows the entire, well, you know, data skills curriculum, if you like, with the streams data governance, um, fair data principles, data management, data generation and use. So I'd like to um, also point out here that we've grouped data governance, fair data principles and data management under the higher level stream of data stewardship. So you can see it's in the different colour. Um, so we feel that these all sort of belong in that data stewardship skill, skills stream. We'd welcome comments on that grouping as well. And as we go through the slides, um, please add suggestions, um, including the skills we've missed, skills that you feel are in the wrong stream or any general comments you'd like to make in um, the collaboration, the collaborative doc, which hopefully I think has been shared or do I need to share it? It's been shared. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so for the first question, I'll grab the Mentimeter code and pop that in the doc there. Okay, so if you go to um, menti.com, and I'll just get this up here and present that slide. And so if you go into there, so the, the question is, what skills do you think ARDC should focus on to enable users to gain greatest benefit from the commons? And um, depending on how you answer, it may mean significant expectation management on AIDC's behalf. So it'll be interesting to see what you have to say. So I'll refresh this. And we might start to see some answers. Is it working? Oh yes, here we go. Right. Managing. Ah, very good. This is really good to capture um, this information from you guys. So while you're populating that, um, I'll keep going because I tend to overload my presentations. Um, so Rosie has already painted the picture of for ARDC moving forward with skills development in her talk, but I think it makes sense to revisit some things um, again. So uh, the emphasis is on working with stakeholders and partners around policy and infrastructure, national skills coordination initiatives, so tackling skills training challenges with a hands-on approach through the facilitation of working groups that we're hoping and I guess expecting to form out of this skills summit. Uh, continuing to build on our existing skills trainers community of practice and many adjunct um, data skills development activities such as maintaining our commitment to the carpentries through varied activities including running train the trainer refresher courses for new instructors, advising on good pedagogical practice with respect to preparing and delivering training, uh, facilitating trainer community activities such as regular community discussions, event planning for things like Carpentry Connect or adjacent co collaborations such as ResBaz, leading by example with the development of open source and practicably fair training materials, for example, our own FAIR Data 101 and Library Carpentry FAIR lesson. 
and looking to the future technology space and supporting partners by conducting and facilitating training and leading edge technologies and also not reinventing the wheel by ensuring that we connect with what's happening internationally around good practice. And last but not least is providing support to the skills related efforts of all four ARDC themes. And wow, that's really great. Um, so thank you everyone for answering that question. We'll, we'll have a really good look at that and see what um, comes out of it. Safe API use, mm -hmm. that's an interesting one, okay. Very good, all right. Um, in the interest of time, thank you. Um, we'll move on to um, the data governance skills slide and people are still going there, which is great. Um, and it might help if I share back my slides. Okay, so um, these are the skills and knowledge needed for the processes of creating and complying with data standards and policies that manage the availability, usability, integrity, use and security of data. We've decided that this is the core set of uh, things you need to know about to ensure good data governance. Now on this slide, um, you'll see the data stewardship skills badge across, you know, on the top of um, data governance. As I said before, we feel that this is kind of encompassed within the data stewardship skills. And I'll just explain train, uh, trainer, educator, train the trainer and materials, even though they may be um, reasonably self-explanatory. But from an ARDC perspective, trainer, educator is where we would provide training for a particular skill or capability um, to the people who will use it. This training can be in the form of courses or workshops or one-on-one -on -one meetings. Train the trainer, this would be where ARDC provides skills activities to support and develop a trainer network in support of a skill or capability. And then of course, materials and infrastructure would be ARDC's um, developing reusable materials, infrastructure and resources to support training, act that training activities around a skill or capability. And you can see here that we've only really put materials and infrastructure um, related to institutional policies, uh, funders policies and also government policy and legislation and trust certification, which is an area that we do have interest in. But there are some caveats here. The areas we've colored are those we have historically been active or see as key things, but this doesn't mean that they will remain key areas long-term. And um, also the highlighting of these skills does not reflect that we'll tackle all skills up uplift in that the particular area. And really in a sense, you know, we, we probably only need to color in a, a portion of, of each of these to sort of indicate, you know, our involvement and um, influence there. But in many of these areas, ARDC does have interest and influence in shaping change. And this influence generally won't come through training, but through the development of materials such as guides, information videos, decision trees, meetings with stakeholders and other skills development mechanism mechanisms. Um, okay, so I obviously stuffed up before you, I, hopefully you didn't miss any of the slides. Um, okay. So this is the fair data principles skills stream. So skills that are useful to create and use fair data outputs and infrastructures that enhance the ability of machines and people to find, access and use or reuse data. It's no surprise that ARDC has wide interest, a widespread interest um, in upskilling around fair principles given the services that we provide. So Research Data Australia, Research Vocabularies Australia, the, the PIDS services and cloud. So this slide shows that ARDC delivers skills development via either train the trainer, where, and this is only where necessary. So what we mean by this is where we have the unique expertise in this area and the training is not offered elsewhere. But mostly we'll be offering training through the, the development of materials and of course our in, infrastructure. We've run a couple of very well received FAIR training courses this year. Fair Data 101 and Fair Data Express, but as we see the continuing trend of institutions and other research organisations delivering their own research skills development activities, we'll step back from this training and instead provide support for FAIR in other ways. We know there are institutions out there, um, including FAIR in their current trainings. We just spoke to UQ the other week, and um, I also know that CSIRO and others uh, are including FAIR in their research data management training um, offerings. 
So once again, I've got another question and I'll just get out of that one, if I can, with the lag. Okay. Ow. I think I somehow clicked on the other one. Sorry. Here we go. So it's the same code again. Um, I'll just present that. So this one is, at your organisation, are you including FAIR data principles in your data training? And so, um, oh, some pretty, oh, it's adjusted down. So no, no, oh, here we go. There's some no's. Wow, this is um, good to know. Just give you a couple of minutes to populate your answers. Hmm. I actually wasn't expecting that. I was expecting that there would be more thinking about it. But that's that's really good to know. All right. Um, so as you continue there, I'll go back to my slides and check the chat. Um, are there any questions? I, I kind of like a, I really am like a freight train when I, I present. So um, if there are any comments, Liz, or um, questions, or uh, we can just keep going otherwise, and probably best to given the, the timing constraints. So the next set of skills is um, data management skills, and these are the operational management and um, that they offer skills around um, operational management and oversight of data assets to help provide users with high quality data that is easily accessible in a manner consistent with the data governance framework. So you can see from this slide that we are again mainly concerned with providing materials and infrastructure and the trainer educator aspect is related to our training um, in using our own um, in the use of our own retention and discovery infrastructures. So that's why we um, have a training, a trainer educator focus there. Hopefully I'm not going too fast through these slides, but they, they, the slides are in the co collaborative doc. So, you know, while you're, you're listening to this presentation, if you have, you know, if you want to go back to a previous slide in the doc and make comments and things like that, um, please feel free to. So the next set of um, skills is data generation and user skills. These skills are useful for researchers and other data generators to ensure their data is at the outset structured and managed in such a way as to facilitate use, reuse, high quality and reflection of impact. Now in previous iterations of the skills landscape, we had um, data generation and data use separated onto two slides. But it seemed a little nonsensical as data generators generally use data and data users generally generate data and it's sometimes difficult to delineate. So now they're grouped together. Um, so any comments on that decision would be um, welcome as well. And the data stewardship skills are a duplication on this slide. Um, but we thought it was important to highlight that data generators and data users still need to have some level of data stewardship knowledge. Now your thoughts here, does this muddy the water? Um, should these skills be removed from this slide and we simply represent this connection in another way? Um, so please provide um, any uh, comments that you have. And you know, the skills themselves, I mean, if anyone sort of has any questions about the skills, um, please put those through as well because the terminology um, in particular. So now we're on to the, the roles slide and this normally comes right at the end of the pack but I've done it a little bit differently here. This is a generalised list of roles and is reasonably self-explanatory but it's worth pointing out that people in their day-to-day -day roles often cover more than one of these roles. It's rare for these roles to be specifically dedicated, except possibly in larger organisations or on a large scale project where you can find um, data specialists. 
And the next slide looks at who needs data skills and at what level of competence based on their role. Um, and I'll unpack that in two slides. But I just want to sort of reiterate, these are generalised roles. Um, so they're not the kind of roles that you would see um, a person's job title. Um, well, not necessarily. You might have people who are you know, data governance experts or whatever. But so we look at um, who might need these skills. And the short answer is those who use or will use the data commons. On the following slide, there is a more descriptive breakdown than the previous slide of um, the types of roles that we're looking at. But while I'm on this slide, this explains the legend found on the next slide. It describes the competency levels of a skill, awareness, beginner, intermediate and advanced. Now, part of the work surrounding the skills landscape will be to standardise the terminology for skills development to ensure we are all on the same page and talking about the same things and um, to help with this, a skills landscape glossary is currently in progress but we will need um, community input from that once it's at a point, you know, that it's consumable. And as an example, I've used these terms for competency levels, awareness, beginner or foundational, intermediate and advanced. And I notice others um, are using slightly different terms. For example, intersect use introductory rather than beginner. Um, one step would be to establish the competency levels, their descriptive names and a description of the competence required at each level that we can all agree on. Now, th this slide is, so you can see the, the roles across the top here, uh, researcher, data scientist, etc. And then the skills landscape um, skills are on the, the left vertically. So what we're doing here is based on the four competency levels, this mapping, oh, and actually you will have noticed, but you know, the, the, um, the legend here is, you know, awareness, beginner, intermediate and advanced. So based on these four competency levels, this mapping highlights who needs what skills and at what level of competence. And by the way, I'm more than happy to be challenged on the, the rankings that I've made here. This kind of mapping provides us with a general idea or starting point from which to identify the skills development focus for each target audience. Um, and it would be really interesting to, to know if um, people find this reasonably useful. Just to quickly point out too, we're not the only ones looking at skills frame, frameworks. Um, there are a number of international efforts that we should be connecting our work with, such as um, SFIA, so Skills Framework for the Inter Information Age. Um, and these, this is for those working in information and communication technologies, software engineering and digital transformation. And what I'll do is I'll just pop the link to that in the chat. Um, okay, it's gone out to everybody. So, um, and another step in developing a national skills framework is to create a number of key profile, um, key role profiles, starting with those highlighted in the who needs these skills matrix from a previous slide. These profiles highlight relevant responsibilities and related tasks for the specific role and are then matched to the skills from the skills landscape. So you can see here responsibilities, tasks, and then here we have the list of the skills landscape um, skills. And um, I'd also like to say, oh, and sorry, I've got myself lost. We now have a, a skill, so from this, basically what we're trying to do is um, create a skills requirement list for a role. And in the example on the screen, this role profile is for data repository managers, which is kind of equates also out to data curators, data archivists and data services librarians. Um, this is still a work in progress. And so uh, if you've got any, it's probably a bit hard for people to read on the screen, but you know, if anyone is interested in it, I'm more than happy to share and have comments made. I'd also like to say that um, some work has already been done on role and skills profiles by the um, European Open Science Cloud, EOSC, through their skills and training working group and FAIR for S skills pilot project. Irina Kuchma from IFL, the Electronic Information for Libraries, and um, she's also the, the working group's 
rapporteur, we'll be providing a presentation in our final session on Friday at 1pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time. So be sure to come along to, to that session because I think it'll be really interesting. And of course, they're not the only um, folk that are, are working on, you know, roles and skills profiles and, and other aspects of um, skills frameworks. And I will also pop that in the chat, link to the FAIR stuff there. So coming back to the role profile, um, you'll notice the persistent identifier and is hyperlinked here in a couple of places actually. So this actually links out to a learning path for PIDs that, um, or persistent identifiers that we've created. It still needs to go through a review by our PIDs experts here at ARDC, but is part of a proof of concept to illustrate how the skills landscape can be used to connect trainers and learners to coursework, training events, and associated skills development materials. Um, you can see it is fairly stock standard for a learning path providing information to assist the potential learner. So description, time to complete, which hasn't been determined in this one, um, skill level, learning outcomes, who the learning path is for with a table to indicate the, the level of competency for the specific role um, or required for that role. And then a breakdown of the resources to use for each level of co competency and learner user at that unit that that learner requires. And so, you know, there's the beginning part of the journey. So for awareness and um, the introductory level, then, you know, learn a bit more so that you start getting into that intermediate level and then building on your expertise to, you know, where you can actually apply those skills um, at the, the more advanced level. So in this case, all the resources were available for free online. In other learning paths, we wouldn't buy this necessity point to training platforms that may require subscription, a fee or negotiated agreement. And some examples might be Data Camp, O'Reilly Online Learning, LinkedIn Learning, courses and materials through training providers like Intersect, QCIF and others, training provided through universities um, that could potentially be shared um, based on agreements and so on. So this is another way of raising the visibility of trainings and materials available across the Australian e-research sector. And these le learning paths can also be seen as a trusted resource because they will be curated by experts in the topic areas. So now for the scary bit, um, I will just grab because the only reason why it's scary is because I think it will, may potentially fall over. But I'll pop a link to a spreadsheet um, that I'd like you to, to all go to, and it might take a little bit of time to actually um, load up, but we'll see. And in this spreadsheet, what I'd like you to do is answer the question, who is responsible for the development and delivery of skills in the areas below? So what we've got are four tables um, for each of the, the skills. Now, what you need to do is actually put a comma after each so that it will reg be able to register. So if you're putting a, um, a number in, just follow it with a comma for the next person. And so you can start to see that these um, radar graphs are, or charts are starting to populate. And I think it's just useful as, as a, a skills and training community to see where we think, um, you know, these, these particular skills should sit, where the responsibility should sit for the, the training and, and materials development and so, so on. Now, if it gets a little bit too slow or if people are, you know, there's lots of people in one cell, just move to another chart if you want to another table and start populating there. So I'll give you, um, what have we got? We've got a little bit of time. So I might give you, you know, five or more minutes to, to get in there and um, populate your answers. And I might just try and catch up on um, chat if I can.
Um, and, you know, obviously we could change the charts around um, depending on how this data sits in these, these radar charts. I'm not a data viz person, so not an expert in terms of what really works for this kind of data. Um, okay, we've got people populating in here as well. Catherine, we've got a um, question from the chat um, from um, if do asking do libraries count as skills per, sorry skills service providers? Um, I would so as separate to unis and research institutions. Is that the question, or is it so for me? If I'm defining um, well. Yeah, a skills service provider, I probably am, am thinking in terms of paid services. So I would put, uh, in, in relationship to, oh sorry, in relationship to this particular activity, I would include library service skills providers pr or provision of services, uh, training pr services from librarians in the unis and research institutions column. Yeah, so. Sorry, my, my dogs are barking in the background. So, very distracting. I don't know if that really answered the question, Liz. I think, yeah, no, I think it did. Um, I'd be asking from a university perspective. Yes. Yeah. Actually, Belinda, um, that's a good point. And it, some comment, yeah, it, some comments too around, um, you know, whether this is even covering all of the, the various service providers, because there's also commercial um, training providers as well, uh, like Microsoft and, and those folk too. So it doesn't really cover the full gamut. Um, you know, in the, the end, it was, more of my brain function was going into how do I actually get people to contribute this data than um, the the nitty gritties of, of who each um, group was. But anyway, it, this was a, a kind of, I, I guess, really we're looking at trying to ensure um, there's an appropriate cover, coverage of skills across the sector. And so we need to start mapping this out to do that. And this is kind of my cursory or high level attempt at doing that. So um, someone with much better statistical skills, um, please talk to me at some stage and, and we might do this on a larger scale. Uh, yes, that's a good point too, Fiona, that um, publishers do um, some training too. Okay. So we can, um, you, this, this document is open as well. So anybody who wants to contribute to this, post this session, you're more than welcome to keep adding to it. Um, and what we'll do is we'll come back to this on um, Friday. We've got a drop-in session, just a very informal session on Friday before the final um, international perspective session and so we could come back to this and, and have a bit of a chat about this in the in the drop-in so I'm getting close to actually winding up my um, presentation so I've got so I'll, I'll move away from this and get into the final slide um, there we go so encircling back to the beginning 
To provide James and many thousands of other Australian researchers with the best possible advantage through data, they need the most relevant data skills training delivered by people with exp expertise and in a variety of skills development formats. Um, the ARDC skills focus is evolving. We're going to be narrowing, but deepening our focus on specific skills areas and looking at our approach to skills development delivery. This approach will be much more targeted to our remit capacity and importantly towards enhancing the use of the commons. We're aiming to partner on skills development where our expertise and services add best value. So we're hoping that our skills providers will do the same and together with the help of the skills landscape and associated work, communities within the sector can identify their areas of responsibility for data skills uplift and begin to surface current and future envisaged skills activities to enable coordinated approaches to skills development and delivery, reduction of duplication and address deficits in coverage of skills and competencies. And so that I guess, you know, my sort of call to action thing here is we need a national approach. Um, that's what's required. So 